All right, good evening, good evening. Uh, welcome to Butner Fellowship. Go ahead and open the, uh, your Bible to the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to continue our Acts study. Uh, Acts chapter number 11. Uh, we left off in the book of Acts, uh, and as we know, we've been teaching the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts is a transitional book. Uh, I was speaking with a gentleman uh, yesterday, and uh, he was trying to, uh, I guess, uh, we were trying to have a, a Bible study, so to speak, because he had some things, some issues uh, in the scriptures that he didn't quite understand. Uh, but the more, but the more he tried to, uh, we had this dialogue, the more he kept going to Acts for doctrine. And when you go to the book of Acts for doctrine, it's not a doctrinal book. It's a transitional book. So you're going to find doctrines of grace and doctrines of law within the book of Acts. So you can't take it for doctrine. Uh, and, and that's what I was trying to get him to see, but he uh, he, he didn't quite understand that. And, and so the book of Acts is just the acts and the activities of the, of, of the, of the Holy Ghost through the apostles. And what we see is that now we're in Acts 11. We're saying that God has now changed the program. So you're going to see, you're going to see, uh, uh, still see the terminology uh, uh, and some things contained in the law because it's a transition and you won't, it won't be completely finished as far as the, the finishing uh, of the law program and, to, and now the dispensation of grace until Acts 28. But as we go through it, we're going to continue to see that and as you as you really break down the book of Acts, most people say uh, it's a big issue now speaking in tongues and those things in the church. Uh, uh, being water baptized. We see all those things in the book of Acts. And most people, because they don't rightly divide, they think that because they did it in Acts, we still do it today. Uh, and, and, and you have to rightly divide the book of Acts. And, and that's what we're going to see as we continue to go through this book. But you got you, you kind of got to be you got to be careful because some people just use this as doctrine. Whatever Acts says, they just take it for doctrine. If they did it in Acts, we can do it today, but that's not always the case. Uh, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you now for your goodness and your grace. Thank you. We thank you for your understanding. We thank you for uh, your son Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. And Father God, it is his blood that has uh, given us the atonement now. Father God, we have we receive uh, salvation as a present possession and it's eternal life. Uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift that is freely given unto us. Father God, you have made your righteousness manifested. You have manifested your righteousness now without the deeds of the law, uh, which we couldn't keep in and of ourselves anyway. So we thank you right now. Father God, we ask that you continue to give us the mind to, to serve you. Father God, continue to perform the good works in us that we may be pleasing in, uh, 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 to our brethren and to people that we come encounter with every day. Father God, give us a mind to speak the gospel and preach the gospel of grace such as we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Acts chapter number 11, starting at verse number, uh, I believe we left off right at verse 15. Right at verse 15, Acts 11, verse 15. Uh, we begin to see here, uh, Peter, Peter is given, Acts 11, we see that Peter is uh, given, a, uh, is given a, a, an account or a, 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 of what we just saw in Acts 10, because if, if you look at 11, uh, Acts 11 and 2, it says, uh, and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they were of uh, the circumcision contended with him. And we understand that they can, the reason they contended with him is because he had went in uh, and, uh, to the Gentiles and Cornelius in his house, so the Jews were contending with him. Uh, so Peter is giving them an account. Look at Acts 11, verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on, on, a, on us at the beginning. And we went through when Peter just began to speak. He didn't even get to uh, uh, any the message because his message was going to be the gospel of the kingdom. But he began to speak, and when you begin to speak, it should always be about who? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. So, and, and as they begin to speak, because the dispensation has changed, now the Holy Ghost falls upon them in the minute when you, you believe. Because you hear, you trust it, you believe it, and then the Holy Ghost comes upon you, just like in this verse here. So, but that you have to understand that that never happened before. Which is why they were astonished. Acts 10 and 44 says that Peter and the Jews that were with him were astonished when this happened. Mm -hmm. So you got to understand that this never happened before. 
uh, uh, look, look what Peter began to say, as on us at the beginning, right? So this is Peter making his point to these uh, Jews that said, listen, don't get mad at me. Don't contend with me. This is God's doing. You know, a lot of times when people, uh, when you witness to people about the truth of God's word, they get mad at you like you, you're somebody. But all I'm doing is just giving you the scriptures, right? So don't get, Peter said, don't get mad at me. Because all these things that I'm telling you that happened, they happened because God wanted it to happen, right? Not because I wanted to go in and break the law, because they weren't even supposed to be uh, uh, have anything to do with Gentiles before this. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Peter is instructing them here. Look at verse 16. Then remember I, the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with what? Water. Water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Holy Ghost. Now Peter. notice this now. Most people who don't understand the Holy Ghost and fire, they don't understand that the fire baptism is something that's not one that's going to be good. Baptism just means to be identified with it. We saw this uh, Sunday. We saw this issue. Go to Matthew 3 and 11. Just so we can uh, understand this issue. For some reason, this is a, it's a, this is a uh, a troubling issue in churches today. This issue of baptism. But Matthew 3 and 11, this, and this is what Peter is quoting here. Because he says he remembered the word of the Lord. So he remembered this. Matthew 3 and 11. This is John the Baptist speaking. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mighty than I am the shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. Fire, right? Go back to Acts 11. Now why does this verse not mention with the Holy Ghost and fire? The program. The program, right? Not necessarily the program, but the fact that the fire is representation of being identified with the wrath of God. You don't want to be identified with the wrath of God. So Pastor, that goes back to the uh, scripture in Isaiah when, when Jesus opened the scrolls when he first started his ministry and he uh -huh. read and then he stopped and closed the book. Uh-huh. Because that because the rest of that in Isaiah, that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh it wasn't supposed to happen. And he read this, he read it and opened it, but he closed it says he closed the book. Uh because the things that were if he would have kept reading, it would have been things that were to happen out here. And so he couldn't he couldn't read that those things yet. Uh but, but, but notice it says, but the Holy Ghost is not with fire. So it doesn't say fire here. And the reason then is that out here he's going to baptize unbelieving Israel with the fire. Verse 17. For as much then as God gave them, and what did God give them? The what? The light gift. What is the gift that he gave them? Which we just read. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, right? Notice that the Holy Ghost is a gift. The Holy Ghost represents eternal life. That's why they could not get an indwelling Holy Ghost back here. Because they didn't have eternal life as a present possession like we have today. Right? So the Holy Ghost came upon them and, 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 and the Holy Ghost indwells us today. It is the power of God which lives in us. Right? The third person of the Godhead. So, so when we look at this issue, the day in the dispensation of grace, when you believe, you receive. Most, most of our denomination of brother who are lost, they don't understand the dispensational change. So therefore, back here, they didn't get the Holy Ghost at the same time they were, they were justified, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because their sins were admitted, but not, uh, not forgiven. Yeah, that's, that's it, but why, didn't they re why couldn't they receive the Holy Ghost the minute they believed in the Messiah? It was a process. It was a process. He had died. Huh? He had died. He hadn't died yet. He says, if I don't go, the comforter can't come. Right? So he hadn't died yet. So the conversion from being justified and saved, they were justified, being justified and receiving the Holy Ghost all in one process couldn't happen because they were walking with Jesus. So they couldn't receive the hope because the comforter, the Holy Ghost couldn't come until he was gone. Because that's what the scriptures say. He said, if I, if I don't go, the comforter can't come. But when I do go, I won't leave you lonely. I'll send you a comforter. So their being saved and then receiving the Holy Ghost couldn't happen at the same time. 
And you have, you have to understand, they had to be fit to receive the Holy Ghost. They had to be fit vessels, which means they had to have the water baptism first unto repentance. Then they had to bring forth meat work for those repentance. Then they could, the Holy Ghost would fall on them, Acts 2. Because that's what the scriptures prophesied about in Joel, right? So understand that it was a separate process over here. Now today, because we receive everlasting life as, an, as a present possession, we can receive the Holy Ghost the minute we hear and trust and believe in the word of God, right? And once we, once we, once we believe, we receive. There is no process now. Because how in the world are you going to be a, 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 a son of God but don't have his Holy Ghost? You see, that how, how today, in this dispensation of grace, how is it that you're going to be a, a son of God or a child of God, but you don't have his spirit? You see that? So, so, so understand, understand the change of process. But the gift is the same. Understand the gift of the Holy Ghost was the same here when they got it, and it's the same for us because it's the same spirit, right? Uh, for as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, notice that, what was I that I could what? Withstand, Withstand God. See, this is Peter talking to them. He's give, explaining to them why this happened. Who am I to withstand God? God wanted this to happen, not me, so don't contend with me. Right? And this is what you have to tell people when you're witnessing. When they don't want to see the, see the truth in God's word, you just let them be. Because, listen, it's not nothing that I'm saying. Because the minute you witness to somebody, they're going to tell you what the pastor said. I was talking to uh, somebody yesterday, and they were saying, well, my pastor broke this scripture down, and blah, 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 after I've had a dialogue with this person. So the thing I wrote was that, okay, you know what? You listen to your pastor, and I'll listen to God. And that's the last thing I left him with, right? So, so what people want to do is be so involved and so stuck on what the pastor says like it's the end all, say all, be all. But the final authority is not what the pastor says. The final authority is God's word. Amen. Right? So, so understand that. So Peter is saying, I don't have any power to do these things. It's, it's God. And then, in part, and then Peter didn't even know about the change. He still don't understand the change anyway. So he had to say it was God. Because he don't understand. He couldn't even explain it even if he tried. Because he doesn't understand it. Verse 18. When they heard these things... They what? Yeah. Held, their Held their feast. Because now they're saying, well, okay, Peter was right. Who are we? You know, we contend them, but after after saying that, who are we to say he, was, he did wrong, right? So they held their peace, and then they did what? Glorified. Glorified God. See, the issue is God, and the issue is Christ. When you make him the issue, if people will humble themselves, they're going to what? Glorify God. If they don't want to humble themselves, they're going to continue in their ignorance, Right? Uh, and, and saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto what? Life. life. Understand now this is what? Eternal life. It wasn't that way before, but it's eternal life. And that's what God has granted unto the Gentiles. Because remember before, the Gentiles were not even in the plan of salvation. But now God is now giving them, granting them repentance unto eternal life. Jesus. Something had to change. Verse uh, 19. Now remember verse 19. Go back to Acts 8 and 4. Remember after the storm of Stephen, you had the persecution of Saul. And because of this persecution, you had, uh, 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 you had uh, th those Jews that were there, they scattered. Go to Acts 8 and 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad were everywhere preaching the what? Yes. Preaching the word, right? Now, notice these were Jews, and most people think, okay, this is what this what starts the Great Commission, because it says they went everywhere preaching the word. But and go back to Acts 11 and 19. In your Bible, does this start a new paragraph? Yeah. Yeah. It, it does? Mm -hmm. In your Bible, right? Yeah. No. Do you, some, do, some of you had a paragraph yeah. index? Yeah, I got a paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. Some Bibles do. It starts a new paragraph because this is a continued conversation from Acts 8 and 4. Now, it goes from giving a recount of Peter's testimony of going to Cornelius to jumping back to Acts 8 and 4 when they scattered. Mm -hmm. See, 
going so on. So now I'm telling you what's going on because Acts 8, 9, and 10, remember I was telling you it was happening simultaneously. Right. So in Acts 11, now it's picking up after when all that stuff left off. Mm -hmm. See, because in Acts 8 and 4, it started the conversation, but before that, it's like God is saying, these things have to come first. Mm -hmm. The saving of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Ethiopia, you know, Acts 8, 37, the saving of Paul, Acts 9 and 15, then the saving of uh, Cornelius the Gentile, Acts 10, verse 44. So when you see these things, those things had to happen, and now God is saying, okay, remember what I said in Acts 8 and 4, when they scattered abroad, now I'm finishing that thought. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why God wants us to study to show ourselves approved. He wants us to be able to study. He's not going to just put it all together because he wants us to be able to study it. Right? Because as a Bible student, this, is, this ought to let you know to study your word. Most people would read over this and not even make the connection. And I'm talking about a whole lot of people, pastors and bishops and whoever else. They'll read over these things because, it's, it, it, because they don't study the Bible uh, uh, rightly divided. Because when it says study the Bible, the only scripture it says study the Bible is 2 Timothy 2.15 but then it tells you how to do it. Rightly dividing the word of truth. But notice after it says study to show thyself approved unto God, it says what? A what? Workman. A workman. A workman is someone who works on their craft. You have to be a workman at what you do. In order to be an effective witness, you must be a workman in the scriptures. Now notice workman is not the, the definition of you doing some type of work. The workmanship is the studying right. to show yourself approved. So you have to study to be approved by God. Then in your studying, you have to be a workman, which means the only way to perfect you, your, your knowledge in the word of God is to study it. Mm -hmm. And then how you study it is what? Right. Rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not just dividing God's word from the Quran, mm -hmm. truth from error. It's dividing the truth from the truth. Mm -hmm. So understand that. Most people think that scripture means dividing truth from error, some kind of other book. But that's dividing truth from truth. So when you become a workman in the scriptures, you'll, uh, the Bible student will see things like this. The average occasional Bible reader, which are most preachers, unfortunately, they won't see these things. Right? So, so that's when you're studying, everything makes sense. Line upon line, precept upon precept, because the Holy Ghost teaches by comparing what? Spiritual things with spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 2.13. Right? Uh, so, so let's get into this. Not they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. Stephen was right in Acts 7. Yeah. So it's, it's, like, it's like this should have been Acts 8 and 5. Because right yeah. this, this verse should have been right after Acts 8 and 4. Yeah. Right? Uh, traveling as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to what? None yeah. but the yeah. Jews yeah. only. Yeah. See, most people would say they went out preaching the gospel to the world. They went out preaching the word. Yeah. But they only stuck to the Jews only. That's, That's what it says. That is an important key factor sure in Scripture. Yes, sir. And that one verse really ties in chapters 8, 9, and 10. That one verse. Mm -hmm. It gives you a better understanding. Mm -hmm. Right? But, but if you miss those details, you miss it. Right? And so that's what we have to see. Go to James, the book of James. Go past Paul's epistles to the right. And it's uh, the book of Hebrews and then the book of James. James 1 and 1. I want to show you something here. James 1 and 1. James 1 and 1. Now, notice it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the what? Twelve tribes which are what? Scattered abroad. Greeting. So who is this book talking to? Twelve tribes. The twelve tribes which are most in the context of those ones that we saw in Acts which were scattered and also those people that's going to be out here. So that's the rim. That's the rim, yeah. Those ones that are scattered abroad in Acts 8, that's who this is talking to, which, is, which are Jews. So this book is not talking to us today, mm -hmm. right? 
Go to 1 Peter, one chapter over. Uh, one book over, should I say? I'm sorry. One book over, 1 Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout. And then look at verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience. Now, he's talking to the elect, right? The elect Jews that, that received the election of grace that, we, that you see in Romans 11 and 5. But look who he's talking to. Strangers what? Scattered abroad. So understand that these books are future books that were talking to Israel, the little flock then who were alive when Peter wrote this, but more so the look, those people, those Jews out here during that tribulation period. Go back to Acts 11. I just wanted you to see how important it is to understand the details of Scripture. So when people say that something about the Great Commission, you can take them to Acts 8 and 4 and then take them to Acts 11 and 19. When people talk about the Great Commission. Because Acts 8 and 4 says they went out preaching the word. They scattered. But Acts 11 and 19 tells you the audience in which they preached it. That's important. Uh, verse 20. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians. Now, remember, remember what, who Grecians were, right? Mm -hmm. Were, were the uh, Jews that were born in a foreign country? Yeah. Right? Uh, we saw that in uh, Acts 6. Uh, verse 1, uh, Acts 9, uh, verse 29, we see the word Grecian. So understand that these were still Jews. Most people say think the word Grecians means Greeks, but that's not the case. Grecians were just Jews born outside of Jerusalem. Just citizenship. Yeah, citizenship, exactly. Uh, verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number what? Believed. And turn unto the Lord. When you preach the Lord Jesus Christ, people are going to begin to believe, not on what you say, but on what, what was said about him. Right? Because you could, you could, and most people say, oh, you know, uh, it's some, uh, uh, one of these gospel rappers, uh, uh, somebody was telling me something about he was anointed. He's anointed because he's drawing people to Christ. I said, he's nothing more than an, uh, a motivational speaker. Because just because you're talking about Christ, in a sense, does not bring them to salvation. Because when they talk about Christ, most people refer to Christ in his earthly ministry. We know no man after the flesh, yet we know him. Because today, the only thing that saves you is not to just know him, is to believe in his work and what he did on the cross. The death, burial, and the resurrection is what saves you. So it's not just enough to know him, right? You have to understand and believe on his work. Uh, verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as what? Antioch. Antioch. Uh, look at verse 23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was what? Glad. Glad. And ex exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would what? Cleave unto the Lord. So he was glad to see them, right? Excuse me. Now what did he see in them? What does it say he's saying? The grace, the grace, of, the God. grace of God. Notice this now. Paul, uh, Barnabas was a companion of who? Paul. Paul. So he can see the grace of God, right? Keep that in mind now. Verse 24. For he was a good man and full of the what? Holy, Holy, Ghost. Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. So uh, look at verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to what? Tarsus. To see who? Saul. Now why do you think this happens? After coming to Jerusalem, uh, uh, and, and, and then they sent them out to Antioch, and the people, he was glad, exhorting the people. Now they're sending him to where? Tarsus. To see who? Saul. Why do you think this is? Because he's <laughs> bringing back to see how these people accepted God. Huh? Didn't the angels tell him to do that? No. Uh-uh. Because, because when before, was the last he, before he was converted, Saul was the one who was persecuting, persecuting them the most. So, he, so if, if he goes back and sees a change in Saul, then he knows something's going on. That's a good point. That's good. And what was what was what does Barnabas' name mean? Consolation. Consolation. 
Right? So the last time we heard about Saul was what? Not when he was persecuted, but then he was what? He was saved, but he was what? Blind for three days. And then who can be saved? Go, let's go back to Acts 9. Go back to Acts 9. Acts 9, verse 26. And when Paul and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all what? Afraid. Afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But who took him? Barnabas. Barnabas took him. Listen, Barnabas took him, and that's that's what we see. When you finish out the chapter 9, it goes into Paul, it says Paul returns, returns to Tarsus and those things. But after that, then you go into back to Peter, Acts 10. So the only thing that we know since Acts 9 is that the disciples probably were still what? Afraid, Afraid of him. So who would they send to go see him? Barnabas. Barnabas. That's, why they depart. That's why they depart. Go back to Acts 11. Acts 11, verse uh, 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus but to seek Saul. Because he was probably the only one who wasn't afraid and understood his purpose. And probably only and probably understood Paul's grace message more than anybody else. As a tie that into Galatians two and seven in, in, that, in that section right there. Two seven through maybe when when they actually shook shook hands and uh they said we're gonna go to the circumcision and uh Barnabas and Saul uh, Barnabas and Paul will go to the uncircumcision. Yeah. Uh go to Galatians. Galatians 2. <coughs> this is this is good. This is this is good. I didn't think about this. This is good. Uh, go look at verse nine. Now, verse seven is where it's but but contrary but contrary wise when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostle of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the who? Gentiles. Now this proves in your Bible that there was two separate Gospels and that it wasn't the same thing. I was talking to a pastor yesterday and uh, he just could, he, he said, I, I just believe that there's only one Gospel just proclaimed in two different ways. I said, and I, and I gave him the scripture at 1 Corinthians 1 and 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the, cro the uh, cross of Christ will become of none effect. That's what scripture I sent him. Because for you to say that disregards this scripture, and you're just and you're making it sound good. Because it doesn't matter what you believe, but it matters what God's word says. And then I, after I sent him, then I said, well, since your belief and understanding of the word, uh, uh, understanding of this, of that particular issue goes against God's word, I'm going to have to side with God's word. And then I said in this scripture, I haven't heard back from it. So, so, so I want you to see that this explains that there's two different gospels. Because if it was the same, it would just say the gospel that was given to Peter, it, now that gospel is given to me. But there's two different ones. But look at verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and who? Barnabas, the right hands of what? Fellowship, Fellowship that we, me and Barnabas, yeah. should go unto the heathen and they unto the what? Circumcision. So Barnabas was his traveler, so he probably would have known more about grace than anybody else. Because he was traveling with him. Now, this, this is not scripture. This is what I believe according to scripture, which you don't have to take it because it doesn't matter what I believe. But but what I'm but from what I gather in scripture is that no one knows the author of Hebrews because God didn't want us to know. But the only person that would know about the grace of God more than anybody who would have been able to write to the Jews would have been Barnabas. Because Paul couldn't have wrote it. So it would have been Barnabas. But that's just my thinking. You don't have to believe that. Because I don't want I, and I always say that. Don't take my word for it. Study it out yourself. But the issue that we wanted you to see is that Barnabas was always with Saul because everybody was afraid of him. All they heard about was him persecuting people. But if you go back to verse uh, 13, uh, uh, Galatians 2 and 13, 
and the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away. So Peter, because he, Paul withstood him to the face because he now, he didn't sit with the Gentiles anymore because these prominent uh, Jews came, so he tried to remove himself, even Barnabas did. And he probably really understood the grace message. And even he disassembled himself. So go back to Acts 11. But that's a good point. I, I, I didn't think about that. And we'll try to finish up this chapter. Now, uh, verse 25, then departed Barnabas to, Tar to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called what? Christians, Christians first in Antioch. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's deal with this issue of Christians. Should we call ourselves Christians today? No. Why, why would you say no? The word that was a uh, it was a term that was used that was thrown at people who followed Christ, but now we're part of the body of Christ, so we're considered saints. But is the word Christians bad though? No. Mm -hmm. I think Christianity is more so a religion. As a connotation today, Christianity is more of a religion. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. As a negative connotation, I can agree. But but is it? wrong to use the term Christian today. Today, he's, he's, he's listening to what he's saying. Now, is it, uh, he's saying today. I believe so. You believe because so? Because they were trying to follow. The definition of Christian according to the Bible is a follower of Christ. So, do so why would that be a bad thing? We're not doing what he did. His work is already done. So we just accept his work. Well, we do that, but that wouldn't that wouldn't disallow the, the definition of a, of a scripture. It was a bad thing then, and at this particular time when and they, they were they were actually insulting or mocking them in Antioch. Okay. So and, and, but 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 and, and, well, let, let, me, let me let me say this: if me if I'm witnessing to somebody who's lost and don't know about the Lord Jesus Christ. I won't say I'm a Christian. The reason being is because Christianity in itself has become a religion. And most people view that as just another religion. So when you say you're a Christian, you got Christians on TV after making a, a, a rap album that you can't buy uh, because the words are just so vulgar saying they are Christians. You got people that, you know, uh, every, everybody is a Christian. <laughs> The president professes to be a Christian, and he believes in same-sex marriage. So the term Christian does have a negative connotation, but biblically it's not wrong. Because being a Christian means to just be a follower of Christ, right? But if I'm witnessing to somebody that's lost, I wouldn't say that personally because of the negative connotation that it has. If I'm just talking to... If I'm just talking to people who believe and who understand, Christian wouldn't be a bad term because we understand that to be a follower of Christ, right? Uh, I, what I would tell people is that I'm a Bible believer. I'm, believer, that's I'm a Bible believer because that's what we are. Because even if you say I'm a grace believer, most lost people don't even know what that is. So I would just say I'm a Bible believer, and then you can explain to them the grace message. So, so when you when you're witnessing the people, it, it, it's kind of it's not. It's not a bad thing. I'm gonna go to Acts. Uh, I'm sorry, not Acts, but Second Timothy two and nineteen. The word Christian is only used three times in Scripture. Paul never uses it in any of his epistles. The Book of Acts says it twice, and I'm gonna show it to you. And uh, Peter says it once. Second Timothy. Second Timothy uh, two nineteen. Uh, this this is a big. Well, not, I wouldn't say big issue, but a lot of times it's hard because most people always look at these people who profess to be Christians that don't really, you know, do what they are, 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 are not Christ-like, should I say, in their behavior. Uh, and, and that gives believers a bad name because they think that how can the world can this be a Christian, a follower of Christ, and he's acting like that. So it's a negative connotation, but I want to show you some things in Scripture about this word. 
Now, Paul never says it, but this is the closest thing that he, that he gets to it, the actual word Christian. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standing sure having been sealed. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that what? Name is the name of Christ, which means you professing Christ, which most people call Christians are those who what? Profess Christ, right? So this is, the, this is the only time Paul gets even close to mentioning that word. But he says, let everyone that name it the name of Christ do what? Yeah. Depart from iniquity. Why? Wow. Right? You see that? So, so go now go to uh, Acts 26. Well, why, why does it say you have to depart from iniquity? Because there, there are expectations that come along with being a follower of Christ. I think. Yeah. Uh, because Paul, Paul even says in Ty, the book of Titus 3, uh, uh, be, it said, he says, and be careful to be careful to do good works because it's profitable unto men. Right. right? So if you name the name of Christ, you shouldn't be doing anything iniquitous and things that are in opposition to God's word. Right? So if you let them that name it the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Right? Uh, what did I say? Acts what? Acts 26. Look at verse 25. Now this is uh, Acts, Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26 are Paul's three. Uh, accounts of his conversion, but it's written by who? Um, Luke. 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 It's Luke's account from what he said to, to for Paul was telling him, right? Uh, look at Acts 26, verse 25. But he said, I am not mad. This is Paul. Most noble fesses, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. So Paul is talking to King Agrippa here uh, uh, about uh, uh, what's happening and what's going on. Look at verse 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? Mm -hmm. I know that thou believest. This is Paul talking to him. But look what Agrippa says in verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou what? Persuaded me to be a what? Christian. Now, was this a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. Right? It's not a bad thing. Why? What was Paul talking? Go back to verse 23 and look what Paul was talking about. That Christ should what? Suffer. And that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the who? Gentiles. So he's preaching Jesus Christ, him crucified and him rising again. To the Gentiles. To the, to the Gentiles, right? And so understand. When King Agrippa says, almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian, it's not a bad thing. Look what Paul says. Look what Paul, and Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, 29. But also, all that, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether what? Such as I am. Except these what? Uh -huh. So Paul is basically calling himself a what? Christian. Christian. Oh. You see that? Because he said, such as I am. So he's preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And then because he said that, uh, uh, King Agrippa said, almost thou persuade me to be a Christian. Paul says, almost what? And altogether, such as I am, I would that you guys be that. Mm. You see that? Mm. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter uh, 4. First Peter 4. I, I just want to go through this because the, 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 the issue of Christians sometimes is, is misconstrued as a bad thing. Yeah. But now most believe no, most non-believers do make fun and say Christian as a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. But for the most part in scripture, I don't see that the term was used negatively. Having said that, even like I said earlier, if I'm witnessing to somebody that's lost, I don't even want to be associated uh, with Christianity. Because even Christianity, in a sense, has become a religion. Even though I'm a follower of Christ, Christianity in and of itself has become a believer. And, and also another thing, what do the Mormons call themselves? Christians. Christians. What do Roman Catholics call themselves? Christians. Christians. Right? 
So it's a broad category now. But do they really follow Christ? Those religions. Follow the law of Moses. Right? So, so understand, when I'm witnessing to somebody, I don't want to be associated with any of that. So I don't use the term Christian. Although if it's a sense of people who understand the term and how it's used in Scripture, then it's okay to say it. Right? But it's not a bad thing like most people make it out to be. You know what I mean? So, so uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Peter's talking here, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So Peter is telling him, listen, this fiery trial, don't think it's strange, because understand this is a future book. Don't think it's strange like, like you know, something is, 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 something has happened to you that's strange, because this is prophesied about. Verse 13, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's what? Sufferings. Sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with what? Exceeding joy. Verse 14, if ye be a reproach for the name of Christ, notice it says the what? Name of Christ. What did Paul say in 2 Timothy 2, 19? Them that what? Name it the what? Name of Christ. See that? Uh, happy are ye for the spirit of glory of God rested upon you. On their part, he is what? Evil spoken of. Right? So some people think about Christians and Christianity because they don't believe in Jesus Christ as what? Evil spoken of. But look what Peter says here. But on your part, he is what? Glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Don't do that. Right? But yet, if any man suffer as a what? Christian. Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him be glorified. Let him glorify God on what? This behalf. So even then, it's not a bad thing. Go back to Acts 11. I just wanted to show you that the term Christian is not necessarily... The biblical definition of it is not a bad thing. But understand that because you have so many people professing Christ but not departing from iniquity, then Christianity in itself has become a religion. Right? Roman Catholicism is a religion. Mormonism is a religion. And they call themselves Christians. Right? So Christianity is a religion. Even in the, uh, most of any denomination. And really the term that Paul always uses is what? Believers and saints. Those are the only two terms he uses for those who are saved. Believers and saints, and then he'll call them brethren. Right? Hey, hey. So, so if Tim Tebow was on TV, and they was calling him, uh, they, they called the man a Christian. Christian, yeah, and, and a lot of that was to mock him. Yeah. You're right, yeah. What if he'd be like, what if he was like, no, nah, I'm a saint. I think that would have been worse. On whose part? On oh, like, you think they would have mocked him worse? Not, not necessarily. And, they, and matter of fact, Tim Tebow is a good example because people made a mockery of him because he professed his faith so openly. Right. And I wish he was a grace believer, but, you know, he, he's not. But I wish he was a grace believer. Uh, but, uh, but because he professed the name of Christ so much, people really was trying to make a mockery of him. Yeah. Right? So in that sense, it, could, it was used as a, probably a negative thing. Yeah. Right? But he himself, and what he believes, and he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, then, you know, that's that, that's good for what he's saying and why he's saying it, and name the name of Christ. But other people, like you said, they, they ridiculed the guy just for being a Christian, uh, just believing Christ. So you have you see a lot of that, especially in, you know, that, that world. That world is, that is a sinful, sinful world. Uh, this whole world is sinful, but, you know, in the NFL, you see a lot of things that I'm not even going to mention, but you see a lot of things that it just, it, 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 I just thank God every time I think about it for keeping my mind yeah. uh, uh, through all of that because it, it's a lot of things to, that they do, it, it's a lot of things that they try to do to you and it's almost like because nobody is of the same faith. Everybody, you're going to meet all kinds of people because it's all different personalities, all different people growing up in all different types of the world and all these different things and they believe all different things. One of our team captains was an atheist, hmm. right? And so this is the person we have to follow on the field. But he's an atheist, yeah. right? So, so it was it was tough, you know. So, but but 
But yeah, Tim Tebow would be a good example of how they ridiculed him by using the name Christian. But they also bring in ministers too, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they, they, we have chaplains and those those types of things. And uh, as a matter of fact, that's a good point. Uh, uh, when I played for Seattle, the chaplain there, when Seattle came, this is after I retired, when Seattle came to play here, I talked with the chaplain there, uh, the uh, guy, Mo Kelly, called me, the player, player development guy. He called me and wanted me to speak to the team when they were here because he knew I was in Tampa, he knew I was preaching. And so when I he, I called the chaplain to you know you can get call and make sure it was okay. And the thing that he told me was that don't preach any type of doctrine or religion. Just teach, uh, uh, just teach the Bible. You know that's what he told me. And and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I said okay, you know, I just said okay, whatever. But but they bring them in, but there's still a level of control. Control. You see what I mean? So, so, but, but they do bring them in, and we every every game that we went to, there there was somebody to speak. Even when we were away, they would call whoever was in that city to have somebody speak to the team. But it was still some level of control because the fact that he even mentioned that to me, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, that, that 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 just said a lot. But but anyway, that, that that's what happened. Uh, Acts eleven verse twenty seven. We'll finish up this chapter. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto what? Antioch. And there stood up one of them named what? Agabus. Agabus. And signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Now, dearth means what? Famine. Famine, right? So that's what we see there. Now, the name Agabus means, uh, did anybody know what that means? Right now, the, uh, the name just means, huh? <laughs> prophecy well he was a prophet but his name means locust uh, and you know the, 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 the locust in the scripture they always were really bad news whenever God would say he, he was sending the locust to eat up their crops in Israel and do those things so this is locust and when you see the name Agabus in scripture he's always the bearer of bad news <laughs> he's always uh, uh, look at this so he's telling them about a what? A great dirt, a famine that's about to come throughout all the world. Go with me to Acts 21. I'm going to show you another time that this guy is mentioned. Agabus. He's going to be bearing bad news here too. That's some bad news in 21. Yeah. <laughs> Acts 21 verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named what? Agnes. So he was a prophet. And when he was come unto us, who is us here? Who do you think us is? Paul is one of them. Who is the other one? Huh? No, no, not Barnabas. Who wrote this book? Luke was with him also. And, and Barnabas could be right. Barnabas could have been with him. But I, I see this us as being, because uh, us being, if I'm writing something to you, and I say, hey, us, or we're together, that's going to include myself, right? So, so.